Welcome to the Titanic and Pigeon Forge. My name is Ryan and on our channel, we check out things to do in the Great Smoky Mountains and beyond. Today, we're gonna go inside. We got special permission to do some filming and we're gonna show you what it's like on the inside, how much it costs and help you decide if this is something you wanna do next time you come to Pigeon Forge. There are some things inside I can't show you, like some of the actual artifacts that were on the Titanic. I'm gonna show you some highlights of what it's like inside with Katie and I'm gonna introduce you to someone who actually went down to the Titanic, let us hold one of the artifacts. So without further ado, let the adventure begin. We're going to go inside, give you a full tour of this museum, and we're also going to be giving away a ticket to this museum and give you lots of details. But I did want to show you the parking lot, which is free to park in here in Pigeon Forge as we pass by the anchor. You can see some Christmas decorations on the hat here. And what we're going to do is I'm going to explain to you how tickets work. This is the one place we would definitely recommend to get them online in advance. But if you don't have them in advance, you can come wait in this line like these people are here and see if you can get to one of these touchscreen kiosks where you are able to come and purchase tickets. Now there are certain boarding times throughout the day so you could click on general admission and see what times are available. You can see here 1.30 to 2.30 is available. So I could click on it to purchase an adult ticket which at the time of recording this video comes out to $35 or a child ticket five to 12 comes out to $15. Children four and under are free. At the end of this video, we're gonna give away a ticket to one of our subscribers here on the channel to the Titanic Museum. But before we go in and do a full tour, I did wanna chat with Jody, one of the first Titanic employees about discounts that are available and some other tips. Well, our museum here in Pigeon Forge has been here for 12 years. Our sister ship in Branson, Missouri has been open for 16 years. Most days we are sold out, um, especially September, October, November, December. We have a lot of not only bus tours, but we do have school groups between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So reservations are pretty much required. So just call our 800 number or go on our website to book reservations. If you are a homeschool parent, please call our 800 number. We do have discounts for homeschool families. Uh, we have veterans discounts. We have teacher discounts. We have a lot of discounts for groups and different military, homeschool teachers, things like that. Slower times, like during the winter, um, January, February, we're open to nine to five, nine to six. The busier hours, we can be open all the way till 10 o'clock. We are selling out three, four, five hours in advance. Today, we opened up sold out until noon because we had so many bus tours. Well, thank you so much, Jody. We're gonna go hop on the tour and check this out. Have fun, bye Titaniacs. All right, thank you. You do get audio devices on this tour. We are gonna be tagging along with one of the many tour guides scattered throughout the museum. You'll be handed one of these audio devices once you walk through the line area over here, get your photo taken and you'll be ready to head inside. So I have some boarding passes for you all. These all hold the names and stories of real life passengers and crew members that were aboard the ship. Throughout your tour today, you're gonna to learn more about them. You might find something that once belonged to them. You might see a photo of them. And at the very end is when you're gonna discover whether or not they survived. And there is a boarding pass for you, the richest woman on board the ship today. So welcome aboard, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> so this is our main lobby area. Uh, all the flags around it, these represent the 40 nations that were aboard Titanic. And now we did pull out three very specific ones that are right in the middle, the American flag, the um, Union Jack from the UK, and the Irish flag. The American flag is because, well, Titanic was a British ram ship. She was American owned. An American financer by the name of JP Morgan actually was the one who paid for her to be built. 
Of course, the Union Jack from the UK because it was a British owned ship. And the Irish flag is in honor of the 14,000 Irishmen it took to build Titanic in Belfast, Ireland. So this is our very first room. We call it our model or our map room. Now, the number one thing I like to point out in this room is that everything that is behind glass is an actual artifact. We have about over 300 inside the museum, spread out between 20 galleries. Now, this map over here does depict Titanic's maiden voyage. She started all the way over in Belfast, Ireland, hopping over the English Channel to Cherbourg, France, before continuing on to Queenstown, Ireland. Now, in Queenstown, Titanic actually had to dock two miles away from the shoreline. The ports there were a little bit too small for a ship of her size, so they ended up tendering back and forth passengers from the shore to the ship. But Queenstown is where she would lift her anchor for the final time as she started on her main journey to New York City. So those first three days, it was very smooth, very uneventful sailing, until, of course, Sunday, April 14th, at 11.40 p.m. when our lookout Frederick Fleet declared iceberg right ahead. Now Titanic and her crew, they only had 37 seconds to try and dodge the iceberg. Unfortunately, for a ship of her size, they couldn't turn quick enough. They did hit at 2.20 a.m. the next morning, just two hours and 40 minutes later, Titanic was gone. Now there was another ship nearby called the Carpathia. They were traveling from New York City to the Mediterranean Sea. They heard Titanic's distress calls, rerouted, and went as quickly as possible towards her last known location. But it would take the Carpathia four hours to actually reach Titanic. Once they arrived, it would take another four and a half hours to pick up all the survivors. Once everyone who could be saved was on board the Carpathia, they had to make the choice were they going to continue on to the Mediterranean with their passengers and the Titanic survivors, or would they turn around and take everyone back to New York City? They chose the latter option, turning around, taking everyone straight back to New York City, but that would be just another three days of traveling. It did take three years for Titanic to be built in Belfast, Ireland, and only five days for her to reach the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Out of the 2,208 passengers and crew members that were aboard the ship, only 712 would make it to New York City. Now being here today, you not only honor myself and my crew members, but you also honor the names, the, uh, the women and the children that were on your boarding passes. As I said, these hold the names and stories of real life passengers and crew members. And by holding that boarding pass, you are helping us continue to tell those stories. Now we'll head on into the drawing room over here, traveling a little bit further back in time before to see how Titanic was built. So you see some of the blueprints, some of the artist went renderings of what the Titanic would have looked like in its final form compared to photos of it when it was built. This is one of my favorites is the rendering of the first class dining salon and how they changed to add some extra space is that they built the tables around the columns so they still have more room to fit more people. Gotcha. That's one of my favorite little things to point out. Now in this room, this is where I always like to introduce two very important men to Titanic's story. So over here, this is Thomas Andrews, our chief engineer. He started working at the Harlan and Wolf shipyard at the age of 16 as an apprentice. He worked his way up through the company before he became a chief designer. Titanic was one of the very first ships he actually designed, Olympic being the first. Now, he was on board the Olympic on its maiden voyage, taking notes to see what he can improve on when he started designing his next ship. And he was going to do the exact same thing on Titanic, so he was traveling as a first-class passenger on her maiden voyage. Then, of course, our good old captain, Edward John Smith, over here on this wall. He had actually come out of retirement to go on board the Titanic. He had been traveling for about 62 years as a captain. Now he took his dog, Ben, that's pictured with him on every single ship he ever went on. And while most people know that like any good naval captain, Smith does go down with the ship, the number one question we always get asked is, does Ben survive? Ben does survive the sinking of Titanic because he was actually never on board. When his daughter, Helen, found out that he was gonna come out of retirement to go on Titanic, she was very upset. Not only would he be missing Easter, he would be missing her birthday. 
So he left Ben at home with his daughter to make it up to her. Now this is our shipyard on these three walls here. These are photos of the gantries where Titanic and her sister ship um, Olympic were built. You can just see how much larger some of the machinery was compared to the men working on the ships. Uh, this is Grape's Pub. If you've seen the 1997 James Cameron movie, you probably recognize it. This is a real pub that still stands today in Southampton, England. That's where a lot of passengers and crew members had their final drink before they boarded the ship. But what James Cameron did, this is where he put Jack to win his ticket in a game of poker, was Grape's Pub. Which might sound very fantastical, but was actually based off a true story. A first class passenger by the name of George Brayerton, he was a card shark, or what we would think of today as a con man. He won his first class ticket in a hand of poker. What James Cameron ended up doing, so he wasn't getting in trouble from the family members of Titanic passengers, is that he took different stories that he liked and built them into Jack and Rose. So if he got it wrong, families couldn't get too upset with him because he was so fictional characters that he was just using stories for inspiration. So that was one of them. But this is actually one of the officers of the Mackie Bennett. He was the one who actually recovered this piece. Okay. They had it framed in everything. Wow. Because it was pieces that they had to pick up out of the water before other ships could pass. Pieces of history. This is just um, a model that was made up to show you kind of how the Titanic would have looked. It also explains some of the different areas on board the ship. Every child's favorite one, of course, is the poop deck, <laughs> which is actually just a shortened version of a Latin term for poopus deck. Okay. So this means the high deck at the stern of the ship. Okay. Okay. Not where they took the dogs. Not where they took the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is also very fun because this is the easiest way to show you that between this first and second smokestack, that little uh, window on the very top, that would be the grand staircase, the okay. forward grand. And this one over here would be the aft grand staircase. It was okay. a little bit lower. It only went down about four decks. Well, this one went down six decks. This is also a fun one to show because Titanic has four funnels. Mm -hmm. That was the aesthetic at the time, but only the first three actually worked. Okay. The fourth funnel is what we would call a dummy stack. So if you ever see an artist's rendition of Titanic and you see smoke coming out of the fourth stack, you know they didn't do their research. Right, right. Because this is only ever converted into a ventilation shaft for the kitchen. Okay. So the only thing ever should be coming out of that would hopefully be like really good smelling Smells, food. yes. <laughs> Let's see if you can do it. I'll say it's actually heavy. <laughs> we, we put it just to wait for you. Oh, there, there we go. go. Now the real trick is, can you do it for 10 hours a day? <laughs> so this is the, um, this is an actual size of what a, the way they would have looked like, they actually did 16 feet diameter, so this is half that size. Now we had men working 10 hour shifts a day, shoveling anywhere between 600 to 640 tons of coal. Wow. Now believe it or not, um, the men down in the, um, boiler room actually have one of the highest survival rates amongst the male crew members on board. The Titanic hit right where they were working, so they saw how bad the damage was firsthand, and they raced up to save themselves. Okay. okay. They were actually chosen because you had to have at least seven crew members to man a lifeboat. Unfortunately, you couldn't go to a first class passenger and be like, hey, you've never lifted a finger in your life. But you need to start rowing this boat. Right. You can't right. go to that. So you had at least seven crew members to row a lifeboat at once. Okay. The easiest way to think about it is do you want a steward who delivers tea to you rowing a lifeboat? Right. Or the men who shovel 640 tons of coal a day right. rowing a lifeboat? Who have the muscles. They have the muscle. How are you going to do it again? All right, Micah. You All can right. be on our lifeboat. You got eight and a half more hours to go. <laughs> no. <laughs> One of our favorite fire stokers on board, his name was John Podesta. And he actually saw the Titanic hit the iceberg. He was supposed to be on duty, but he was taking an unsolicited smoke break. Mm -hmm. So he saw it, the impact happen. He got onto a lifeboat. On board the Carpathia, the rescue ship, he wanted to send his mother home a telegram to let her know that he was okay. But the workers on Carpathia, of course, were being overrun by all the survivors wanting to send their families right. notes back home. Mm -hmm. So when it came to his turn, he decided that he was going to get very short, very sweet. And all he sent to her was four letters, and he signed his name. Okay. The four letters he chose to send were S-A-F-E. Okay. That's all she needed to know that he had survived. Yep, yep, yep. And we actually wow. have his telegram right here. 
You want to try it? This is a question. How many female crew members are on board Titanic? 121, eight. 8 or 23 female crew members. I would have thought there'd been more. It females. was actually still really uncommon. People still thought it was weird that women were wanting to work on a ship. Now this is our Father Brown gallery. All the photos that you see in this room, they were taken by one man, and that's Father Brown himself. He was a young Jesuit priest on board Titanic. His uncle had actually bought him a ticket and a brand new camera as a graduation present. Now, he was actually only on board for 24 hours. He's what we would call a channel hopper. Okay. He was on board from Southampton, England, to Queenstown, Ireland, and he got off and continued his own vacation. Okay. When he got off Titanic, he really didn't think much about it. He was on the most luxurious ship of the world. Mm -hmm. But then he heard it sink. Mm. So he went out and developed all of his photos and went around the world for a little over a year, sharing his photos and telling his story about being on Titanic. When White Star Line heard about this, they actually sent Father Brown a cease and desist letter. Every time he talked about Titanic and any time he showed these photos, he was putting the families of the victims and the survivors back to where they were the night it had happened or the night they found out their family did not make it. Okay. He agreed, closing up his photo album and never touching it again. On September 1st, 1985, Dr. Robert Ballard and his team discovered the wreck of the Titanic two and a half miles below the sea's level um, on their very last day of their expedition. That very same year, Father Brown's photo album was discovered in a church attic in Ireland. Wow. So these two very important pieces of history came together on the very same day. Wow. Well, very same year, rather. Now, he took about 180 photos when he was on board those 24 hours. This is only half of them. Okay. And the reason his collection is so important is because these are the only photos ever taken on board Titanic with passengers at sea. Wow. White Star Line was going to wait till they reached New York City to take photos of the ship because they were afraid people would confuse her with her sister ship Olympic because they mm -hmm. had taken her photos in Southampton. Mm -hmm. But of course, since they never got to New York, that didn't happen. Right. This is actually um, the little cease and desist letter they sent him. Now, he did take two Assistant. very important photos. He actually took the only photo of Captain Smith ever taken on board the ship. Okay. And he took the only photo of a child ever playing on board the ship. Mm. That's Master Robert Douglas Spedden. He was six years old when he was on board. And Father Brown captured mm. a, just a fun moment of him playing with a spinning top and his father watching on. Mm. This is another little Easter egg in the film because James Cameron took this photo and added it into the film. Really? So when Jack sneaks up to first class to find Rose, he walks behind a father and his son and steals a jacket off the deck chair right behind them. I think I'm remembering <laughs> this now that you're saying it. Wow. So it's a, little, back and watch it's a it. little fun Easter egg because you can now watch it back and go, that's Robert Douglas Spedden, yep. six years old, <laughs> aboard Titanic. So is the picture of the captain the it, one up front it that is he not. took okay what's the picture so the then? only photo of the captain ever taken aboard titanic many people think it's this photo it's mm -hmm. not it's actually a very funny photo okay because all father brown was doing was he put his camera over the side of the ship and he was taking a photo up at the lifeboats mm -hmm. and captain smith poked his head out just the right time out of the bridge wow and it's the only photo ever taken of him on board the ship. Now this is third class. Hello, Amy Stanley. These hallways are actually built to the size of what they would have been on board Titanic. There were 709 people in third class. Wow. So could you imagine how cramped it could be down there? Sure, sure. Now not only was third class home to 709 people, but it's actually where the dog kennels were located on board the ship. We had 10 dogs on board Titanic. Out of those 10 dogs, three would survive. So we do have a little bit of some elements for the children who come on board the ship with us. They can answer some questions to see if they can test their knowledge about Titanic. And of course, with our dark kennel, they can meet Madame Fru Fru, one of our favorite dogs. Come on, Mike. You want to check out Madame Fru Fru for us? <laughs> now over here, this is the actual size of what a third class cabin would have looked like on board Titanic. Pretty tiny beds. Yes. In 1912, the average height of a man was about 5'5". Five five. Average height of a woman was 5'2". So people have gotten oh, taller. Yeah. That's interesting. This cabin is what we say belongs to the Frederick Goodwin family, the Goodwins. Um, there was nine of them. So they paid $35 nine times for each bed they needed. 
Well, more than likely, they probably only paid eight dollars because Sydney could probably share a bed with his mom because he was one. Now, in today's money, a third-class ticket would cost closer to one thousand six hundred dollars. Okay. How much was first class? I'll tell you that upstairs. Okay. Well, you see our first class room. Okay. Because they had three different ticket prices. Okay. Uh, of course, we have our grand staircase. It's beautiful for Christmas, especially. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes, we do have. We have put up our Christmas decorations for the year. Now, while Titanic never sailed at Christmas because she did sail in April, we wanted to give her the Christmas she never got to have. Right. We know exactly how she would have been decorated, though, because we actually based this off of photos from her twin sister ship. Okay. So this is exactly how the Olympic was actually decorated for Christmas during okay. the season. It's beautiful. Now, believe it or not, us using electric Christmas lights is still technically historically accurate. Okay. Because Christmas lights were invented in 1880. Now, this room is built to the size and scale, what it would have looked like on board the ship. We had the honor of using some of the same blueprints. So everything from the pillars, the back wall, the floor, to the skylight, and the entire rotundra are all built to scale. Now, the wood is made out is oak, walnut, and mahogany with a light honey stain. And like I said earlier, every single design would have been entirely hand carved. Wow. Now above us, that's our beautiful milk glass skylight. This allowed natural sunlight to come streaming through it in the, in the morning. And at nighttime, it was actually backlit by electric lights. Okay. So when passengers were walking down, they still had almost what was like daylight shining down upon them. We ran into Mr. Lowell at the Grand Staircase, who actually went down to the Titanic himself and has some amazing stories to tell. I'll let you listen in. So you've been down to see the Titanic yes, wreckage. Can you I've, tell us all about that? Well, it's hard to tell all about, though I had plenty of time. I was down there for seven hours. Wow. It takes two and a half hours to get down two and a half miles wow. to the wreck site. Wow. They turned off all the lights that conserved the batteries. Now I'm alone with my own thoughts in total darkness. When we arrived, they turned on the lights and moments later, I was right over the bow. Wow. The same spot where Jack in the movie held out his arms that I'm the king of the world. I went right over that side. Wow. I said, take me to the captain's cabin. I heard the side was already gone. They took me there. I was five feet from the captain's bathtub for 10 minutes while they were changing film. Wow. My job was to pick up artifacts. Okay. I found a wrench down there. The mouth on it was this big, sticking straight up in the ocean floor like somebody thrown a javelin. Mm. Found many items of value. We brought them all back, and I stayed focused on picking up artifacts, not emotionally get involved, but after an hour and a half, you see all that debris scattered on the ocean floor. You see a shoe over here and a hat over there, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. All I could think of was what took place that April night. 1,500 souls slipped into eternity that quick. Wow. All of them had plans to get to New York, start a new life. It never happened. Life can be short. Yes. Make sure you tell your loved ones every day how much you love them. Now, before I went down to my dive, they said, if you can find a first class window down there, pick it up. Mm -hmm. We don't have one. Mm -hmm. We don't want any more portholes. We got enough of those. And I found one. Fantastic. We brought it up and they took it out of the basket. And when they did, it bumped the basket. And little pieces of rust from the metal frame of the window fell into the basket. And I said to the crew, excuse me, what do you do with all that stuff in the basket there? Oh, we dump it over for it. I said, no, don't do that. That's part of the Titanic. <laughs> I reached in and I picked up a whole bunch of those pieces and I put them in plastic so they don't get destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I gave them to friends of mine. Unfortunately, this is the last piece I got. Wow. Now, I put it in plastic. It, you might look at it and say, I don't, it looks like a little piece of rust. And you'll be right, that's what it is, a piece of rust, but it's more than that. Yes. This is a piece of the real ship. That's amazing. Titanic. Mm. Come over here, lad. Stand right here. 
turn around and get a picture of this. Hold your hand out. You're holding now, a piece of the Titanic, right into that my lens gosh. And smile big. Let them see your teeth. You are now holding a piece of the real Titanic in your hand at this moment. Do you realize how rare that is? How few people have ever done that or ever will? That's worth thousands of dollars to a collector. Wow. I wouldn't sell it. It's illegal. That's amazing. I'm not giving it to you either. <laughs> Just let you hold it for a little bit. Now you're going to go to school and tell your classmates you held a piece of the Titanic and they're going to say, no, you never did. Here's my telephone number. You have to call me and I'll verify you actually did. He was great to interact with. You'll actually see him later in this video share a story of what it was like on the deck of the Titanic the night it sank. But let's get back to the tour. Now, while all of this had a very pretty price tag to it, mm -hmm. the most expensive and most impressive part of the entire grand staircase was the floor. Okay. In 1912, they called this the millionaire's floor. Only the richest of the rich were actually able to afford it. Today, we have thrown that name away and we just call it linoleum. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was um, a pretty brand new invention still. Uh -huh. The marble design on it took two weeks just to cure by itself. Okay. And unlike the linoleum today where you can just roll it out and be done with it, each right. tile had to be placed hand by hand. Okay. So it was a very long, tiring process for them to even put down. Ended up costing more than granite or marble to have put into your house. Wow. How things have changed. How things have changed. Yeah. It's also very fun when I have to tell people too. They go, okay, so what do third class people have in their houses? I said, hardwood. Really? <laughs> And they're like, really? what? I'm like, yeah, that was the poor person's floor. <laughs> wow. Because they just used the floor that was built with the house, right, hardwood. Right, wow. And now everyone wants hardwood floor, and they're yeah. like, $3,000 for yeah. one room. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Now, this How is the fun part. We're actually one of the only museums to allow our guests to walk up the grand staircase. Okay. So you get to see what it felt like to be on board the grand staircase. Wow. This is a first class parlor suite. There were 34 of these on board Titanic. Quite a change from third class. Yes. Now what these rooms would have, you'd have this private sitting room and attached with an adjoining door would be your bedroom. Okay. For a parlor suite like this, the tickets usually ran about $3,000 in 1912 or $95,000 today. Oh, uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> now, for Charlotte Cardeza, though, she had the money to spend, so she got a millionaire suite. Okay. There were only two of these on board the ship, one on either side. Okay. It had a bed, two bedrooms, mm -hmm. a private sitting room just like this, a private bathroom, because even in first class, they shared bathrooms. Really? Yes. Wow. And then a private promenade deck, or what we would think of as a balcony today. Okay. In 1912, that ticket went for $3,300. You would be paying $125,000 today Ooh. for the Millionaire Suite. Wow. Now this room um, is actually rented out in the style of the room that was rented out by Isidore and Ida Strauss. They were co-owners of Macy's Department Store. On that back little cabinet back there, we have a photo of Isidore and Ida. The bus in the middle, that is a bus that stood in Macy's Department Store after the wreck of Titanic. It says Ida. Now, they were traveling on board, going back to America after spending a vacation on the French Riviera. Okay. When they, on the night of sinking, Ida, um, Isidore led Ida and her personal maid, Miss Ellen Bird, to lifeboat number eight, assisted them into the lifeboat and stepped back. The officer in charge of filling that lifeboat turned to Isidore, basically explained to him that he didn't think anyone would object if he wanted to take a seat next to his wife. He looked around, he saw that there were women and children still on board the ship. He saw there were men younger than him still on board. He didn't want any special treatment, so he refused to take a seat. When Ida learned that her husband would not be joining her, she took off her long fur black coat, handed it to her personal maid, Miss Ellen, and said, I won't be needing this where I'm going, and got out of the lifeboat to rejoin her husband. When there were only two lifeboats left on board, Isidore was begging her to take a seat in one, she finally just turned to him and said, we have lived together many years. Where you go, I go. Mm -hmm. I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so we shall die mm -hmm. together. Wow. They were last seen holding hands on the boat deck when the water washed them away. Mm -hmm. Ida's body, if recovered, was never identified. Mm -hmm. Isidore's body was recovered and identified and buried in New York. And we're very honored because we actually have an artifact that has only ever been on display here. It's this one right here. 
This is Isidore's pocket watch fob. It was connected to his pocket watch and it was covered off his body. This is the first time in 110 years that his family, the family's ever given it up. Wow. They've been in the family ever since. It was his great, great grandson that brought it in for us. Wow. If you open it up, it has a photo of his oldest daughter and oldest son in it when they were children. Mm. It's one of our favorites. Mm -hmm. One of the main inspirations for um, Jack and Rose, because uh, where you go, I go. If you jump, I jump. Mm -hmm. It's where they took it from. Okay. Uh, this is our first class hallway. This is what we kind of would consider a mirror maze for our museum. Okay. Because we have to make sure no one turns that way. <laughs> yes. This is just kind of give you show you how long the hallways would have been in first class. Yep. Definitely has that feel yes. of being on a ship. That's also the room where a lot of people... <laughs> now this is our music gallery. It's actually in the design of what the first class dining salon would have looked like on board. Wow. So this is where we honor the eight musical heroes that were aboard Titanic. They either played as a trio or as a quintet. The only time they ever played as all eight was the night of the sinking when Wallace Hartley and the band decided to play music to help calm the passengers down. Now, towards the end of the night, Wallace turned to the other musicians and said, it's been a pleasure to play with you all. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm. Hoping that they would find safety in lifeboats of their own. Wallace stayed behind, reshouldered his violin, and continued to play. One by one, the other musicians returned, picking up their own instruments and continuing to play with him. Now, the last song they ever played together was their um, Wallace's favorite hymn, Nearer My God to Thee. Mm. Let's see if I can remember how to play it now. Thank you for playing Thank that. You. Thank you. That's, That's the awesome. only song I know how to play. <laughs> <laughs> I taught it myself. Now, also in this room right now, because I know I've talked about the movie a lot, mm -hmm. but this year's actually the 25th anniversary of the movie, okay. coming up in December, because it was released December 12th, I do believe, okay. 1987. I make people feel old when I tell them I was only a year old when it came out. Yes, you do make people feel old. So I was like, I think it was December 12th. I don't remember. I watched it later on. But in honor of the 25th anniversary, anniversary, we actually got some of the costumes back from the oh, movie. Oh, that's awesome. So this is Rose's, what they call the sinking coat. Mm -hmm. It's a coat she had on while trying to rush on through. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had the corset that her mom was lacing her into and reminding her, we are broke. You need to marry Cal. Right. <laughs> and then, of course, we have one of the Heart of the Oceans that was actually made for the movie. Okay. And then we have our bridge. And then here's a little bit of a closer photo of a photo of Captain Smith taken on board as well. Okay. So it's blown up right there for everyone to see a little bit better. Ah, there he is. Do you see him, Micah? Mm -hmm. So this is our bridge. We call it a moment in time. The only thing that moves in this room is the helm. So this right here is the only thing that will move. The clock is stopped at 1140. You cannot move the telephones, you cannot move the telegraphs right here, and you can't open up the compass right here either. But this is actually built to the exact same view as it would have been that night. So the view outside is what they would have seen. Mm -hmm. We actually had an astronomer come in and they helped pinpoint where every star was that night wow. in the sky. Wow. Micah, you wanna steer the ship? You gonna save us? Turn! <laughs> Turn! Turn! Well, the good thing is you're moving the right way too. <laughs> Good job, hard to starboard. So what ended up <laughs> happening that night is that Frederick Fleet was up in the crow's nest. The easiest way to think about it is that he was looking out into the night sky. They did not have binoculars. Unfortunately, there was another officer by the name of David Blair. He was the first officer. He was bumped off to, and was replaced by a different crew member. And when he left the ship, he accidentally took the binocular keys with him to the room. And so they were looking up outside and Frederick kind of just thought to himself how strange it was that all these stars were in the sky except for a giant black spot in the middle. Mm. And when he looked closer, that's when he realized it was a iceberg. Mm. He picked up the phone on the crow's nest, 
which made the phone on the bridge over here immediately ring. The officer on duty answered it, asked him, what do you see? He spoke his infamous words of iceberg right ahead. Mm -hmm. It's 1912, they're very polite. So the officer replied back with thank you and hung up. Mm -hmm. He then walked on over to Robert Hitchens and he gave the order of hard to starboard. I'm gonna turn it again. Turn it starboard. Oh, so starboard, go, go right. Here, good I'll hold you. Okay. <laughs> Come on, iceberg. <laughs> You're doing good. You're doing Save great. Us, <laughs> <laughs> now you turn, and unlike our helm, which will go around and around forever, Robert actually had to lace his arms in between and hold it so the water didn't try and push it back the other way. Wow. And all they could do was watch as the iceberg in front of them started to move slowly to the right. Mm -hmm. There and there was a shake, which would shake the helm. And in two hours and 40 minutes, this entire room would be under the water. That's just how quickly Titanic would have sank. Mm. Now this next room is very cold. It's always set anywhere between 48 to 52 degrees at all times. Okay. Uh, that's actually 20 degrees warmer than it was the night of the sinking. It was 32 degrees that night. Wow. But this is supposed to give you the feel of what it would have been. <sighs> and then if you'd like, if you reach your hand over the deck there, you're allowed to touch 28 degrees salt water. Whew. Do you like that's it? That's cold. Refreshing. <laughs> you want to jump in? No. Up to your neck, you know. Ooh. Now, a big question we also get is how people always ask us how it's not frozen, the water isn't. Yes. That's because salt water actually freezes at about negative six degrees. Okay. This is our movie gallery. Um, tells a little bit about the boilers, which we talked about downstairs. This team was piped to these reciprocating engines. 10 to 15 minutes of video is, and just continues on on a loop. And we do change it out during certain months. So during March, there's actually a different video in here. Now, this is our children's gallery one of my favorite galleries in the entire museum. This is also where we have some of the, the photos and the names of the 69 Jewish passengers that were on board. So while we're celebrating the 69 Jewish passengers this year, next year, we're calling it the Year of the Children. We're okay. celebrating the all 135 children that were on board. Oh, so we're gonna nice. have a brand new exhibit laid out just around the kids. So every year you do a new exhibit, mm -hmm. okay. It's very nice. Yeah, keeps it fresh. Keeps it fresh. You can yeah. still kind of see the old things, but also something new. So he was assigned Master William Carter, who was one of the richest little boys on board Titanic. And in our children's gallery here, he's actually able to see what William looked like when he was on board the ship. Now, second class, we had 27 children in second class. Out of those 27, 26 would survive. Okay. Now third class, of course, is where it hits hardest. There was 97 kids in third class. About half of them do not make it. Wow. But one of the funniest stories in third class is of little Monsa Karoon. She was four years old traveling with her father. They were on their way to Illinois. And she, her father actually was able to get both of them dressed through the chaos of the third class cabins up to the boat deck. And there he handed Monsa over to a woman in a lifeboat. When he tried to take a seat next to her, the officer in charge of it stopped him, said, sir, it's women and children first, you need to wait your turn. He tried to explain to the officer what was going on. If he did not get into this lifeboat, his daughter would be an orphan. The officer, however, was not gonna let him through. Monsa wasn't really understanding what was happening. She didn't speak a lot of English. All she saw was this man holding her father back from joining her. So she did what any four-year-old does best. She starts throwing a tantrum, she starts screaming and crying, and when that doesn't work, she bites the officer's arm that's holding her father back. Well, the officer immediately ripped his arm away from Monza, looked at her father, Franz, and said, get into the lifeboat and keep control of her. Hmm. So her tantrum ended up saving her father's life that night. So there is good that there, comes from tantrums. Some, there's good that comes from tantrums. <laughs> or as I tell my field trip groups, I said that's the only time you're allowed to throw a tantrum yes. is when your father or mother's life depends on it. Exactly. Now this is a very fun room for a lot of people. This is our interactive gallery. Okay. So if you'd like to test out your strength with the sloping decks, you can see if you could survive holding on to the degrees at which Titanic was sloping. Now I am going to let you know you are cheating just a little bit because you have rubber sole shoes and no one on board Titanic had those except for one person because they were really, really expensive. Mm. So the grips you have on the bottom of your shoes, imagine if these weren't there. Imagine if you were just in your socks on that. Slippy. That'd, that'd be slippery, right? Yeah. You're going to try the 30 degree angle? 30 degree slope, that's at 2.05 a.m. Is it getting a little harder? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even with your grip Even with your grips. shoes. <laughs> now that's the hardest one. This is a 45 degree slope. 
Now, think of it this way. You're about to get on this one. This is at 2.18 a.m. Titanic sank at 2.20. Wow. So this is two minutes before it sank. So when you're on this one, think that in two minutes, it goes from 45 degrees to a 90 degree angle and then down. Whew. Try 45 degrees. Can you do it? You might just have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> you might make it. You might make it. You're doing great. Now you can also sit in a lifeboat. So this is the actual size of a Titanic lifeboat sat, um, cut in half. And in here you can actually press the buttons and hear the stories of the passengers who survived in lifeboat. So if you push the button, it tells their story. Lucio Carter has an interesting background if one is to believe the family story. Now the real question is, do you want to try some Morse code? So over here, you can see if you can send out a distress signal. Welcome to Titanic's Marconi Room. You are about to send a distress signal. She did it. I'll see. If it, let's see if it can pronounce, it can't pronounce my name. If it can't pronounce your name, it just says operator. <laughs> and if it can't, it will actually say your name. Operator. <laughs> now here is another um, little prop from the movie. This is the violin that the actor playing Wallace Hartley played. Okay. It's actually signed by some of the cast members. Yes. And Miss Celine Dion herself signed it. And then we have yes. one of their Oscars that they won oh. for best costume design with some of the little details that came off her jumping dress. So you can enter into Tot Titanic, that's what we call it, and see if you can dodge the iceberg. Turn, 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 turn. <gasps> you did it! You did it! You uh, got your cardio workout there. This is our newest in the interactive gallery. This is Dive to the Titanic. So they can do a little, some little submersibles that you can kind of control and you can explore some of the artifacts in the wreck site at the bottom of the ocean. So he is building the Titanic. It's a little magnetic puzzle game to see if that, any of the kids can actually put together what the Titanic would have looked like. And then we also have where you can test to see if you can tie some classic boating knots. Okay. I think the bowline's the easiest one. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I went for this one. That was easy. I think the sheet bin's not too hard either. So this is the memorial wall. This is where you can discover whether or not your passenger survived the sinking. It is in alphabetical order by last name, separated by class or by crew. So that'd be his father. So he's right next to him. All right, let's see if mom survived. Charlotte Cardeza. Charlotte Cardeza. I survived. You always die when we come here. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I'm done, I'm and you Let's have see. Alfred Norney. You survived! The first time ever. <laughs> so now in the next room, you can actually find out what happened to your passenger after the sinking of Titanic, oh. after what they did after surviving. But this is the world's largest Titanic Lego ship, 56,000 Lego bricks. Wow. Take him 11 months to build at 10 years old. He's on the autism spectrum. Micah, 10 year old, built this Lego ship. You need to get on it. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take him to build? Do you know? 11 months. 11. So there's a little show that happens. So he didn't put the light lights in there, they added that later? Yes. Okay. So how we got it was that it was actually in a museum in Norway. Our owner was talking about wanting to put lights into it so we could kind of put it as a part of the show. Mm -hmm. The best part is, is that, of course, when we first got the ship, type Lego was not making little Victorian people, little mm -hmm. Edwardian people. Right. So he had put all his different own little Lego people on it and mm -hmm. we had Darth Vader at the helm. <laughs> There's also another little tiny Easter egg on the, this Lego ship because we have tiny little Jack and Rose at the bow. Oh, wow. For their arms. Yes. I'm flying. I see <laughs> her. <laughs> you see that, right? So you were married twice, two children, successful stockbroker, lived in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and you were a race car driver. <laughs> You had quite the life. <laughs> you also snuck your way into first class because you originally boarded as a second class passenger. This room also has Mr. Lowell when he is able to be at the Titanic. He is an amazing storyteller. 
So I wanted you to listen in to this story. I've been down to the Titanic, by the way. Uh, very few people have ever done that. Fewer than 200, I was the 109th person chosen to go down. I've written a book about my dive. It's here in the gift shop. If you want to know how and why they chose me to go down, it's all in this book. Now, throughout your voyage today, you've heard various passengers and crew stories. Well, I want to end your voyage today with a Christian story from one of the clergymen aboard the ship. His name was Reverend John Harper. He was a Baptist minister from Glasgow, Scotland, on his way to Chicago to preach at Moody Church. When the Titanic started to go down, Reverend Harper ran around the deck shouting, women and children and unsaved people, get aboard the lifeboats. Can you imagine that? <laughs> this is a Baptist minister still preaching while the ship is going down. He even took off his life vest and gave it to a man that was not a Christian. Thought that'll give him time to get his soul ready for eternity. My, what a sacrifice. He knew he was gonna die. His daughter Anna was standing right next to him and his sister-in-law, the sister-in-law overheard the reverend when he gave that life vest to that man. He said, here, take this, I don't need it. I'm not going down, I'm going up. Wow, testimony of faith, unbelievable. He's in the water now, 28 degrees. Will you put your hand in that water? Can you imagine your entire body in that? Feels like a thousand knives stabbing him. And a man drifted by on a piece of wood. Reverend Harper shouted to the man, are you saved? The man said, no. Reverend Harper shouted, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The man drifted off into the dark, and later the current drew him back. And Reverend Harper again shouted to the man, Are you saved yet? And the man said, I can't honestly say that I am. Reverend Harper's last words were, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And with that, the reverend slipped under the water and went to that frozen, watery grave. There were 12 people pulled from the water that night. Six of them lived. That man was one of them. And that story was told a few weeks later in Hamilton, Ontario, by that same man who said, I listened to Reverend Harper's last message and became a believer in Jesus Christ with two miles of water beneath me. That's a true story. And that's in this book right here, Diving Into the Deep. This is, uh, this is the book about my dive. In fact, it's, it's about my entire life, but I know you'll enjoy it in the gift shop. Thank you very much. God bless Thank you. Thank you, brother. Captain. Let's check out some of the items here in the gift store once you exit. All sorts of Titanic puzzles. Got some little stuffed animals. For $7.99, the kids can get a Titanic captain's hat here. For $24.99, you can get this battery-operated boat. And they have a number of different block kits. I don't see officially Lego license, but Similar to Lego, or this one for $260. Get yourself a big fancy Titanic that you can build. All sorts of different coffee mugs and teacups over here. Lots of different shot glasses. All sorts of hats that you can get here. They also have these hat and t-shirt combos for $19.99. It's only small and mediums. There's a couple of different shirts that you can get. I do like this one right here that says Great Smoky Mountains, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Like the movie Titanic, you can get yourself a large heart necklace for $109. Or this one says a deluxe one for 189 or you can get a smaller one down here for 59.99 here's the perfect set of shirts for a couple they are twenty dollars each you just need to make sure you actually stand in the correct positions or it won't make much sense 
But uh, yeah, great for an anniversary trip or a honeymoon if you're down here and you come to the museum. Pick up a pair of these shirts, $20 each. They do have copies of Lowell's book that we saw earlier here in the bookstore. I'll also put a link in the description of this video if you can't make it out here and you'd like to check out his book, check out the link down in the description to our Amazon store where you can pick this up. They have a number of movies, including James Cameron's Titanic, as well as a number of different books and this titanic Opoly for $29.99. If you love to collect pennies, you can get yourself a collectible coin album with a Titanic penny included. They also have these heart necklaces for $16.99 or if you're really thrifty and want to give someone special a heart, you can get a chocolate one for 39 cents on your way out. They do have some Christmas ornaments. This staircase bell is $22.99. Here in the gift shop, they do have some restrooms down here as well as a place that you can purchase photos. So here is a fancy necklace. Maybe Miss Katie can explain this one for us. So this was made specifically for the museum. This is our own heart of the ocean worth a quarter of a million dollars. 24 karat white gold and then 155 karat Jaworski sapphire surrounded by 58 round diamonds. Wow. <laughs> so this is our own heart of the ocean that was made specifically for the museum. That wraps up our virtual tour of the Titanic Museum in Pigeon Forge. Keep in mind there were so many things that I could not show you and I had to actually trim this down. Katie our tour guide did such a phenomenal job and she's told us so many great stories. I had to cut so much out to make this a shorter video. So hit that thumbs up button if you agree that she did a great job and make sure you are subscribed as we are gonna give one of our subscribers a free ticket to this museum in Pigeon Forge. All you have to do is leave a comment on this video or a question that you have. Just make sure that it includes the words Titanic Museum Pigeon Forge and we'll pick a winner at random on a future live stream. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next adventure.